we get started? So, hello everyone and uh, welcome. Um, we're going to give you a quick tour of uh, OPNFV's, OPNFV's Brahmaputra release uh, and specifically talking really around the uh, very quick introductions to what is OPNFV. Uh, it's still a little unclear to some. Uh, a little bit of a, a walkthrough of, of what it is that we do um, and, then, and then where are we going and, and where, are we, where are we headed. Uh, with a focus on how we've been working with OpenStack, um, how we continue to work with OpenStack moving forward, and, and the roles that I think each community, community can play with each other. Uh, my name's Chris Price. Um, I work at Ericsson and am involved with OpenFV uh, as, well, in various projects and on the technical steering committee. So I'm Frank and I'm on the TSC as well. And uh, I think the first thing that we want to go do address is really what is OpenFV, because there's a load of confusion still around what OPNFV does and what OPNFV doesn't really do. Um, so I think first thing first is we are trying to go and, well, do NFV for real. And that means we're going to go and try to go and build the entire Etsy stack that we, well, got laid out by Etsy. But somebody's got to go and pull these things together. Somebody's got to go and integrate that. And once you integrate it, well, you've got to go do that on an ongoing basis because, well, all these individual projects move, right? So there's no point in time where you say, well, we're done, right? Exactly. And it's, it's not just about putting it together and, and, and hoping that that's, that's where you need to be. You need to iterate. We need to come back. We need to look at what OpenStack is doing and bring that in and provide these capabilities for the platform. So for us, it's very much a process of, of each iteration, we come back with new features and new capabilities, we come back with new components in the platform and, and we try and est establish this, this NFV cloud that we're trying to produce. Yeah, so if you look at the cartoon style of what, what OPNFV does, um, on the left hand side you, you further abstracted the, the picture of what Etsy NFV is, right? So it's a little bit of compute virtualization control, storage virtualization control, network virtualization control on top of a physical infrastructure. That's, by the way, one delta mm -hmm. between what, well, a typical OpenStack deployment looks like and what NFV is about, because we are about performance. We are about, well, getting packets shifted. So it's not entirely only kind of, you don't really care where you run. You do care you are, where you run. You do care where you're running on. And, well, building the entire picture, well, means a couple of things that you need to go do. You need to go and integrate a bunch of components, but you also got to go and test them in an ongoing way. And if you test, you find out that there are certain things missing. Even at the requirements level, you're finding out that there are certain things missing. So we ended up having three pillars, right? Yep. Yep. The integration pillar, of course, that's the one where we compose, where we bring things together, where we plug things together. Um, the testing pillar, where we make sure it works, and and we 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 pull from upstream. So so when we do tests, we're pulling um, tests from OpenStack, of course, a lot of tests, pulling tests from Open Daylight, um, pulling tests from the Onos project. Uh, and also building our own tests. We build our own end-to-end -end types of tests. We, we have tests for VNF onboarding. We have tests for VNF onboarding and platform failure scenarios. Uh, we have tests which will then end, you know, give you latency figures on, on how, well, how quickly you can, you can bring uh, features up in the platform, um, how quickly you can upgrade those features or, 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 or take those features away, uh, and, and measurements for how quickly traffic is running through. Um, in addition, new features, very important for us. Mm -hmm. uh, there are things that we want in NFV that we don't traditionally get from a, from a cloud-centric view. Um, we want to see peering using, using BGP from one data center to the other. We want to see uh, you know, SLA managed connectivity services, services to an edge device where we're going to want to put some sort of a workload at some point in time. Uh, we want to see these types of features coming through, and we spend a lot of effort uh, on bringing yeah, that so, forward. Uh, let's understand. What, what what is OPNV and why is it a little different? So what, why did we start OPNV as a separate project even? So why did we put it under OpenStack? Or why did we put it under Open Daylight? Or why did we put it under, ah, we, we <laughs> where do you put it, right? Um, it has m multiple homes, it has multiple kind of upstream sources. Um, so well, if you go and integrate, so if you do in systems integration as a community effort, well, you've got to go find a home, and there is no natural home, so we created a home for it. And there is another thing that um, typically I think people moan about. So where is the end consumer? Where is the end user? How does the end user really take influence over what, you, well, happens? Mm. Usually I think you, you form a project and then you create a user group. 
So you have the inner circle and then you have the user group. Or you vend it. You build something, you wait for someone to try and sell it, and then you have users. I mean, that's, that's right. the traditional open source way. Build it and they will come and use it. And, and, you know. yeah, but in OPNFE right now, we, we do have quote unquote end users. So there's the AT&Ts, there's the entity docomos, there's the... Uh, Orange. The LC Oranges, yeah. They're a part of the project. They're, they're helping stand the overall thing up. They help test it. They help code the stuff. Um, so a different level of participation suddenly happened by making them part of the party as opposed to a user group. So, um, well, and we're not only consuming, by the way, right? No, we participate. So we're only trying to go and fix these things that we, and you identified some of those, those things already. So, um, yeah, certain projects like OpenFE do service function chaining, but they have a problem. Do they have a deployment environment where they can go and test the thing and, and find out whether it really works at system level? No, they don't. So, well, we have a sister project in OPNFE now that, well, deploys SFC for a living and creates a load of test cases at system level so that we can go and test it. Um, so, overall, I think this creates or slowly starts to create, hopefully, an ecosystem where we bring all the individual components together. So this is where, kind of, this is the fireside where people kind of gather from the various areas. Exactly. I think one of the things to remember about OPNFV is, is we're not our own community, we're your community. Um, I think that's, that's something that we've tried to be from the outset. You won't go to OPNFV and find 10,000 lines of code in OPNFV because that's not where we're going to be writing code. If we wanted to make an open stack, we would come to OpenStack to do that, right? If we want to work in open daylight, we go to open daylight to do that. We don't try and, and keep things. Um, so so it's, it's kind of fun to try and articulate the value of what OPNFV is to people. They say, well, where's the code? And it's like, well, it's in OpenStack. It's in open daylight. It's in OVS. Um, and that's a nice kind of transition into the, the next thing. So in many cases, so OPNFV is upstream. We drive change and we work actively in upstream projects like OpenStack. And OpenStack is one upstream. But there is other upstreams, like um, a recently launched one, Fido, um, building another fast forwarder, or the fast forwarder maybe. Um, we need components there and changes there in order to build a full stack of OpenStack, OpenDaylight, Fido VPP. These, need to go, uh, these guys need to go change. OpenDaylight needs to go and change and do the integration more properly. Uh, so we've driven changes across the board, but we drive them upstream. So the principle is always upstream first, right? Yep. Yep, but we're also downstream. We're also downstream. And, well, a load of the things that we do is downstream. Exactly. We, we pull. So once we've gone upstream, once we've built the capabilities we want in FDIO and in Open Daylight and in OpenStack, and, and, and we have, you know, this new forwarder that's enabling us to do, you know, VPN-level uh, service chaining solutions or whatever it's going to be, we bring it back, we compose it, we deploy it, we test it at scale. Uh, we, detest it. We, we test it with resiliency, with redundancy. Um, we, will, we will run a service function chaining solution and then we'll just start to pull things, you know, killing processes, making sure that, you know, the thing still works, we can still handle our application. Um, and we compose, deploy, test, compose, deploy, test for a number of different scenarios. If I'm going to use ONOS, well, I'm not going to be using Open Daylight at the same time, so I have to be able to test and verify both of them and I have to give them the same rigorous uh, set of expectations that I know I can use that component or I can use that component and I can trust that they're going to fulfill the use cases that we have. Um, and we do, the, we do the compose, deploy, test iteratively and over and over again. Yeah, and well, given that we're both, some people say we're not upstream, we're not downstream, so where are you? Maybe we're midstream. So um, it's the create portion that is a significant portion of the work and maybe I think 50% of the people in OPNV are focused on creating and getting things done upstream. And in many cases, getting things done upstream is a teamwork function because your voice is louder and is e more easily heard if you team up. Um, so I, I typically compare that to crying babies. Ignoring one crying baby is easy. Including a kind of ignoring a room full of cry babies is really, really hard. Um, so the create portion is one portion, mm -hmm. the compose portion is another one, and well, given that we want to go build a system, we brought that together in OPNFV, and so hopefully that clarifies a little what, what OPNFV does. And if we want to go sum it up in one sentence, that's probably it, right? Systems integration as an open community effort. Very much. A bit, a bit. And that's not what we are. I mean, we're not, we're not an integration, but we didn't come here just to say we're going to plug stuff together. We came here to actually put 
articulate needs, look at NFV use cases, work upstream, mm -hmm. but we don't, we don't feel that we own, we don't own the code in OpenStack. We don't own the code in Linux kernel. We don't own the code in those places. What we do own, I guess, is the integration of them. So if we need to find ourselves a, a, an entity or, or, or some way of, you know, explaining to people what OpenFV is, we are systems integration as a, as a community effort. So I had a lunchtime conversation with somebody and that said, well, um, so what are you guys really doing and then kind of, how would I go back get started? Because I have something in mind that is, well, virtually PC. How does that apply to you guys? And well, we, we keep on coming back to the, the very same question then, you know, like, what do you run on? And then, yeah, well, maybe you run on an assembly of OpenStack, Open Daylight, KVM, OVS. But somebody else says, no, 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 I want to go use FIDO as a forwarder. Or I have my private version of OVS that is DPDK enhanced. Um, well, somebody needs to go and pull that together. And, well, that leads us to, is there one OPNFV? Is there two OPNFVs? How do we go and deal with the diversity? That somebody wants something different, you might want to do something different than you, right? Um, so how do we deal with that? It's not only, not only. I mean, it's also the in, you have additions and enhancements here. I mean, it's when when you enhance a, a component, all of a sudden its behavior changes. So what what you had is no longer what you have, and you you may have wanted that or may not have wanted that enhancement. So mm -hmm. it's not just I'm using Onos or I'm using Open Daylight. It's it's also I'm using Open Daylight and I'm I'm loading, loading these features in that I need to be able to use in the platform. Uh, and to try and articulate how that comes through. Brahmaputra was a breakthrough project for us. Um, in the ANA release, we built our CI-CD pipeline. We, we put our first platform together. In the Brahmaputra, we basically said, again, everyone, let's all jump on board and let's do this. And we ended up with more than 20 different platforms that we needed to be able to deploy over more than 10 different physical infrastructures across the globe. Um, and that put us in a bit of a, a, a twist. We didn't really know how to do this. We didn't know how to plan this. We, 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 basically set off on the path of trying to prove that we can run our platform, although not just one platform, any flavor of it on any hardware. Um, and we didn't have a process. So it led us to, to defining a new terminology or a new, or a new um, way of expressing one? things. The scenario, exactly. Exactly, so we call this thing that, this assembly, this, you have a mixed bag of things, your choice of mixed bag of things, and you pull it together. And we call that a scenario, which is a deployment of a set of components and their configuration. So it's like Lego blocks. OpenStack is a Lego block or consists of a bunch of Lego blocks. There is a bunch of Lego blocks for SDN controllers. There is a bunch of Lego blocks for virtual forwarders and so forth. So you can piece it together and from the Lego blocks you can build a house, but you can also build a Millennium Falcon, right? Um, it's up to how you assemble the blocks. So what OPNFV does is, well, it assembles things that are of interest. So some people are interested in houses, other people are interested in Millennium Falcons. So if there is a community of interest, we'll assemble it for you. Exactly, and it comes back to the question the EPC guy, virtual EPC guy asked, how do I get started? Well, just, just get started by articulating what you need in a platform. What do you want in your platform in order to be able to run your EPC? And then we can come and we can have a look at, do we have scenarios which provide those capabilities? Um, do we have integration points for you to start to, to, to work towards the platform from your virtual EPC solution or not? Mm -hmm. if, if not, then where are the gaps? What is it that we need to try and solve here? And then we go upstream, we solve those problems, we bring it back, and then we have the scenario that's going to support the virtual EPC solution. And that's more or less the process that we will try and, and continue to work with, looking at new use cases, uh, looking at new network deployment solutions, and we'll have a bunch of scenarios. And, and the, the challenge we have is that the scenarios grow. So, so we went from, from one simple scenario in, in Arno to 24 scenarios in Brahmaputra. What we want to do now that we have 24 scenarios is converge those back. So the 24 scenarios we have, which all provide different feature or capabilities, we actually want to start to normalize those and bring that into a smaller subset so that maybe that 24 scenarios that we had ends up being six, something like that, that provide the full capability in a, in a more controlled and, and normalized way. But at the same time that we've reduced that capability down to six, people are coming in and adding more on the end. Exactly. So we're always <laughs> going to end up with, with quite a large number of scenarios. And you can sort of see it as one of these compressing processes whereby the base scenarios will become feature-rich and feature-rich and feature-rich and we'll keep 
adding these features on the back end and figuring out how to normalize them, how to provide APIs the industry can start to work with, how to provide you know, solutions that I can, I can deploy a scenario and I can either run my IMS system or my EPC system, uh, I can do remote workload management, uh, whatever it's going to be uh, with these scenarios as we, as we mature as a project. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I do believe that I think right now we have these 24. Maybe we can shrink it to your six. Well, maybe not. Maybe not. Um, but there will be new, right? So there will always be these things that are kind of more, more for the masses that have, or catering our, to more people, but then somebody will stand up something that is, well, maybe just for the EPC guy, right? And as he learns how the components work together, he'll probably also learn how to go and be part of the bigger picture. So hopefully there is this kind of gravity that the larger scenarios create so that we have the diversity, but at the same time, we can deliver something that is kind of a more of a, a system or a tighter integrated system with more diversity and more capabilities. And that leads us to another thing, right? So a scenario is a system, right? But does it really work? You've got to deploy it and you've got to test it. Um, you've got to deploy it in a number of different, different platform types. Um, you've got to test it a lot of times. Uh, Brahma Putra was a breakthrough for us in another way. We, we basically stated that, okay, if you're gonna have a scenario, you need to be able to run that Deploy it four times in a row, um, run an IMS system on it, um, run approximately, what would have been, 12,000 tests against that thing, and make sure that it stands up to itself each time. So, so a scenario to make it through Brahmaputra had to have been able to be deployed from scratch on bare metal at least four times in a row with, with a little over 2,000 tests each time, pummeling it to make sure that, that, that it met our standard, if you like. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's deploy and test, deploy and test, and recycle and recycle and rinse and repeat. In Brahmaputra, we didn't quite get to the level where we could hit any given lab with any given scenario. There are, there are configuration and, and software dependencies that cause you know, complications. So, so we don't have the ability at this point in time to say, okay, I'm gonna hit this scenario in, in China on, on, on this Dell stuff, and then I'm gonna go down to, to California and hit the Cisco, uh, and then I'm going to, to you know, Montreal to hit the HP stuff, and I'm just gonna see that it's running smoothly in all of these places. There, there are some issues with switching and, and things that, that we work through iteration by iteration again to normalize how it is that we work with the, with the hardware, uh, how it is that we work with the configurations in order to get the platform essentially deploying consistently across. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one great example of this kind of system level testing is the Arctic project uh, that we wanna go briefly highlight here. And I think it's a very, very good citizen because it interacts with upstream and there is another upstream community. It's not even open source, it's standards, it's Etsy. I think that's a one, one, one big upstream community that we care about quite a bit. And they and, laid out and a couple of And, and ITF. ITF. Should have been and listed. It should have been up there as well, yeah. And uh, they came up with a methodology to do system level testing so that well, if you're a test project, and the SFC guys are a very good example of that, they said, well, we need to do system level testing of our service function chaining. Well, do you really wanna go and stand up your own framework for that or build something and hack something up in Python? No, you don't. But you wanna go and have a system set up where I just insert the things that I, I wanna go run in addition to the basic tests that you're running. And what does Yardstick do in a nutshell? And very simple things. You're sending up a couple of VMs and then they're pinging each other. Or they're running iperf between each other in order to go and have a standard understanding of, uh, of performance and the like. So they're starting off doing distributed things that you typically wouldn't do if you're just doing component or unit testing. And, and so they are allowing you to go system level feedback. And if we're doing this continuously, you get system level testing feedback every 24 hours. And the dream that we have is you push a feature in OpenStack and 24 hours later, you know whether it breaks something somewhere else at system level or not. That's the dream, right? I think Yardstick is a great example of, of being able to compose a system and test it as well. The Yardstick test cases for SFC, um, if you want to test SFC and OPNFV, you, you, will, you will deploy your OpenStack solution. You'll have a specific OVS, which is supporting the, the, the SFC um, capabilities. You'll have your, your open daylight with, with um, with the SFC features loaded, and, and then you'll be having Tacker on top. And then the Yardstick, it's gonna call Tacker. It's gonna say, hey Tacker, set this up. I'll, here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a composition that I want you to, to build into the mm -hmm. system. And it's gonna go and it's gonna deploy that from Tacker through OpenStack into the controllers, uh, down to the network, uh, bring up the VMs, 
and then just make sure that everything's still running. And to be able to do that, I mean, that's not something that's very easy to do. And, and by, by using this common framework that is able to compose all of these things very easily, writing that test case just becomes a, a, a question of, can I, can I describe what I want to test? And then can I push some traffic into that? Uh, and if I can, then I can run an end-to-end -end test case, which is actually using a, a complex compiled system uh, that provides, I would say, one of the more complex network use cases that we mm -hmm. have uh, working on at the moment. So. And if you look at the overall thing, maybe you just go to the website or you go to test results at opnfe.org. Um, all the results that they have, they put into an influx database. And well, you get nice Grafana visualization for doing that. So you have a history of what worked, on which lab it worked, how it worked out. And if you run and run your own stuff privately, because you said, well, yeah, well, I'm doing almost this, but I have something else that I want to go test out. And I might, might even want to go keep it in a proprietary way, but I still want to go and compare it to what happened in the open. Yeah, you can absolutely do that now. And I think that's brilliant that they were building an inventory of things that worked and how they worked and how well they performed. Uh, so you can, well, start to understand what, where are you in the bigger scheme of things. But let's shift focus a little bit to the, not the kind of composition and um, integration and testing piece, but maybe you're missing certain things. That exactly. leads to? Trying to, trying to build new features, trying to create, trying to, trying to implement. From OPNFV, we don't do it internally, right? So it's, it's a bit of a challenge, it's, and it's a bit interesting. We have developers coming to us, I want to build this. And it's like, cool, OpenStack's the place for you. What are you guys doing? I, I don't understand why I would go to OpenStack. Well, you go to OpenStack because. And, and, and we have these conversations around where is it that we need to build things and, and how do we need to build things? And, and we have some good examples of projects that have been able to come to OPNFV, describe from an NFV perspective the types of capabilities and behaviors that they want uh, in order to support you know, interactions with management and orchestration suites or interactions with different networking components, uh, and then go upstream and articulate what they need in the different components in order to achieve those use cases. Yeah, and I think one great example is uh, what the doctor people have done. Doctor is about fault management and, and uh, maintenance. Um, so understanding that, well, a, a certain VM failed. And that's kind of useful because if you're running, say, a, a set of firewalls, then somebody needs to go and tell you, well, that firewall went down so I can flip over to another instance. Or, well, if I flipped over, I want to make sure that I can bring up yet another instance from an orchestration perspective and maybe even fail over to the main instance again. Um, so for that, well, the guys in OPNV said, well, this is not really fully there in OpenStack. So we need somebody to go have this alert send up. We need a proper API. We also need a proper API to bring certain instances down on demand. Um, and well, what you could have done or what they could have done is say, well, let's go fork, do it in OPNFV. I have my own repo. And um, no, they went up. They went upstream, yep. They and went upstream, right. A number of blueprints, you can sort of see them listed, the different things. And, and when you come with a blueprint to OpenStack, you guys are like, what does that do? What does that, what, why does the, what is the purpose of that? So, so there was this concept of, of trying to create the use cases and then, and then linking that into the, into the blueprints you needed and then composing those blueprints uh, into, a, into a workable solution. And it starts by fixing things in the components that we have. And you can see here, the Solometer component got updated, and there, there's actually some re-architecture that went on there in order to make this work effectively. Uh, and the Nova component got updated. And at the end of the day, what we want to do is, is make these changes and then bring them back in to the platform and redeploy them so that we have now have a platform with new pieces of... Yeah, and, and once they came back, they said, well, we have these fixes in AODH that we needed. We now we have them in, and now guys, in OPNFE, you need to go still, I don't have the feature as such, right? I need to have it as part of the platform. So they came back with requirements to the various installers that we have, go, go in, install it for me so that we can go and test it. So they went really full feature, driving it upstream, getting it done, but well, not calling it done because it was an open stack because it wasn't really done when it was an open stack. It needed to deploy and be tested, and they went full cycle. And uh, I think that takes us before to... You, before you flick, go, 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 back, go back quickly, because okay. there is a proof point to what you just stated. I mean, their, their perception of done was when the virtualized infrastructure could help the application solve the problem that it needed. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't prove that by testing it in OpenStack. They could prove that by testing it on a physical infrastructure that had an automated suite that was going to over and over again 
validate that that application could be helped by these features and it could be helped in a, in a timely manner that, that was just good for the platform as a whole. So I think, yeah. Yeah, and then they've done it once and I think the key thing is we don't do anything once. There is no such thing that's done once in OPNFE. That would be useless because the minute you're done, you're almost kind of irrelevant because the world moved on. And so let's move with the pace of the world. That means we got to go constantly iterate. Um, and well, you mentioned that already. We, we don't run a scenario once and test it and call it done. We pretty much kind of run it all the time. We hammer it all the time. I, I was at uh, the ONS a few weeks back and I asked my, my release engineering guy, how many, how many OpenStack clouds have we stood up this year? And he turned around and he said 1,377. Um, which it's a was, little bit more by an hour, I it's, think. It's we're we're way beyond 2,000. Closing hours. on 2,000 OpenStack clouds. But we don't, we don't How many people long. Are in, in this room have stood up 2,000 OpenStack instances so far? Anyone from the... Anyway. Good. <laughs> there, had, there had to be someone on the info team here. Of course. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> uh, but um, so we, we do this obviously in an automated manner. So who's your friend? Mr. Jenkins is your friend. And um, I think the, the key thing is this overall cycle that was already very well articulated by doctor. Um, so they go deploy, learn, and well, they're pushing things into Mitaka. They're pushing things into Newton. Um, and that's ultimately what we want, right? So ultimately we want to go deploy latest from upstream so that upstream learns at system level whether the whole thing really works, whether this alerting mechanism, whether you can fail something over here and then you can bring up another instance there, whether this really works at system level. And I think we're, yeah. we're getting very, very close to being able to to prove that dream. I think that's one of the, one of the focuses we will have over the next six months. So today, today when we're doing this, we, we, take, we take the OpenStack release and we deploy it with the various components. And generally what we're talking about is taking OpenStack and then iterating around OpenStack on the various components and, and deviations of those components. Um, the work that we do in OpenStack generally doesn't come to us until the next release comes out. It's very hard uh, because, because OpenStack has so much composition around that needs to be done. One of the focuses we have uh, and will continue to have for the next six to 12 months, I guess, is to, is to make sure that we are able to support third-party CI. In other words, we should be able to deploy OpenStack main on our labs. Um, this is something that we would like to achieve because then, then we can come to OpenStack and we say, hey, we've got these things we want to get done. Yeah. And we can actually see that they solve our problems uh, immediately. And we can, we, can, we can then work with activities that are ongoing in the OpenStack community. A lot of what happens in OpenStack is very important to OPNFV. It doesn't start with us and it doesn't come from us, but it's important to us. These, there is 98% there is overlap between the communities at the end of the day. The, the, the differences... Yeah, and, and one level of inspiration that maybe may we want to go and share here is another interaction that we have with another community, which is Open Daylight, uh, where they, we asked them, can you do pre-builds of your release, even though the thing might not work? Just give it to us so that we can start to go and integrate. And that we did that prior to the Beryllium release, which came out um, late February, and they gave us code drops late December knowing that it's not working. Guess what, we started to integrate against this thing. And well, nowadays they're all trying to do that as early as possible because they really saw the value. Multiple projects really saw the value because we suddenly were able to go and test drive things that they weren't able to test drive at all because unit tests didn't really reach far enough. Um, and so that's an interlock that we, well, seemingly got to work with one community and now I think for Colorado, so for the next release of OPNF, we are trying to go and repeat that. Um, hopefully, I think with a large set of people, well, in OpenStack, with a large set of people in OVS, what have you, Fido, um, to do that. I think there's another point on the slide that we want to go highlight, which is there is, there is multiple bubbles there, right? So <laughs> there are multiple. What are these bubbles? Multiple labs that we have, the reference systems that we have. Um, OpenStack is putting together a reference lab now, which is great, which means that you're going to be testing against physical infrastructure and you're going to be able to do the things that, that we've been working with. Um, I think that the, maybe the big difference for us is we intentionally set out to have different labs. Uh, we intentionally set out to make life hard for ourselves when it comes to how we're going to integrate Can with Can I ask the question, so how many people, so you, I think you, you still have more than 2,000 two, 2, instances of OpenStack uh, so far. Have you stood them up on a variety of infrastructure as wide as um, Ericsson, 
Dell, Intel, uh, Huawei, Cisco? Do we do that? Now even that lady shakes the hat. I know. Ha, we started winning. She's smart. We're not. That's, that's why. <laughs> we have an edge. Um, so <laughs> I think, yeah, well, the, these community labs, I remember I just flipped the slide, right? Um, we're deploying worldwide on a variety of hardware systems. And um, don't, forget, don't forget the ARM labs that we're bringing up now. Oh, yeah. And, and I think it's part of a, uh, an exercise uh, even of the, the plug fest, right, where uh, we are trying to go get even beyond just x86. Mm -hmm. um, anything else that we want to go say there? I think, I mean, so, so performance is really important for us. And, and there, there's a lot of reasons why we have this. Performance is really important. We want to be able to get the best out of the platform. We want to be able to feed the things that make the platform perform best up back upstream so that everyone has that. We want to also be able to do that across a number of different hardware types. It's not good enough that we can, we can run this on a, on a Cisco system or an Ericsson Blade system. I mean, it needs to run on all the systems, and it needs to run in ways that, that you can get the best out of that system. Because we, we also recognize that certain hardwares are best for certain use cases mm -hmm. as well. It's not just the softwares that are, that are good in certain conditions. Uh, so being able to support and create a solution whereby I have a use case here and I need to solve it, and maybe I need ARM here because I, because I have certain environmental conditions that require me to have an ARM system, I want to be able to use the same platform there because I want to be able to deploy the same applications and I want them to feel as though it's, it's the same environment for them. And there is another aspect, right? You can become a blob on this map. And you don't necessarily need to go into Nate and say, well, I want to be a full community lab and be fully hooked up and get jobs scheduled from, from OPNFE, but you can hook up to OPNFE's Jenkins system. Uh, so, well, you create a Jenkins slave, you hook it up to the, the, the master, and we have even a, a recipe for that, a guide for that. Mm -hmm. And then, well, you can get certain jobs pushed onto your system on an ongoing basis. So if you're interested in a particular scenario and running that scenario on an ongoing basis, even with the changes that OPNV is applying all the time, you can absolutely do that. And I think that's another thing. Like, you don't necessarily have to stand up all the infrastructure to participate in the infrastructure. Okay. So you can become a semi-field lab. Um, relatively easily, and as I said, we have a guide for that. Now, um, well, talking a little bit about Brahmaputra, so what do we have in Brahmaputra that um, I think from a feature perspective is exciting as part of the, not only the pipeline, I think we chat a lot about the pipeline, but... Uh, a, a lot of the features we have in Brahmaputra, I think, are foundational features. We, we, spent, we spent some effort on IPv6 in order to get IPv6 into Brahmaputra, and we have IPv6 for, for support, SFC, land through VPN services, um, you know, resource reservation type use cases and, and fault management. Now these, these in their own right are useful, but they don't solve the NFP problems. And what we'll see in Colorado, for instance, is we're going to have use cases where we start to do multi data center um, reference implementations over a V6 network. So that this is something that the guys are setting out to do now. So a couple of those little blobs you saw on the lab, on, on the, on the, uh, slide, sorry, a couple of those labs, will be connected together to run a sequence of multi-site data center use case mm -hmm. tests um, with, with you know, IPv6 connectivity between them. This is some of the targets we have in Colorado. Uh, service function chaining was put in in a rudimentary fashion. It, it doesn't necessarily support a lot of features that people are very interested in, uh, like multi-encapsulation uh, through chains and things like that. Uh, these are the things that, that are being looked at in Colorado, and that then starts to really address some of the broader NFV use cases. I need to come in on a metro ethernet, and then I want to basically encapsulate on, on VXLAN with, with um, uh, NSH headers in the data center. And I, and, I, and I don't want to have to set up different networks to do that. I would like to be able to articulate that through a single chain. Uh, and some of these things are, are going to be coming through in future releases. Um, I think a lot of the features that we have in Brahmaputra have, have established, well, scenarios, so a platform, somewhere that I can iterate on test cases so that I can prove I haven't broken anything when I start to add new capability. Um, and of course, the ability for anyone. You can come in, as Frank said, come in today with a server, hook it up to our Jenkins, and you can deploy there. You can take any one of our scenarios and, and press a button, hmm. and you'll have it installed. And you can play with it. You can break it. You can even help us fix it. Yeah, and it's, it's, I think some of the things that we also enabled, and you see that pretty nicely from an integration and then testing perspective, we added a, a ton of diversity to what we've been doing initially. Initially, the our new release was just, if we were dab honest, two scenarios based on the very same set of components but with two different installers. By now, we have a, a choice of pick your install tool because 
there isn't industry conversion on one or the other install tool, so the industry convergence is reflected here. Absolutely. Well, we are reflecting the world as opposed to we're trying to go and pick a winner. We're unable to pick a winner. We're open source. We're a pure meritocracy. So we want to go and, well, create a little bit of competition even uh, so that people have choice and can pick and choose. That's what we created, and this is also what scenarios are about. So you can, you can choose from a variety of compositions that are maybe doing a little bit of the same thing, but one is stronger at that one, one is stronger at that one, and well, to the earlier point, maybe for you EPC, you're standing up a difference, or you're using a different underlying stack than the other thing. And, and I think we're trying to mature that over in uh, the, the Colorado release even, uh, to um, how we're dealing with scenarios, how we're composing them, how we're releasing them, um, and that may, maybe leads us to, uh, to the what's of, next. To the what's next, right? So the, the, the what's next is for sure going to be called Colorado. Uh, that's an easy one. Uh, so not this. I think we're, we're we're spreading out over continents now. So we seem to we seem to be touring the globe. Yeah. Yeah, we're yeah. We're, we're traveling the globe with the river. Um, so what's next in Colorado? We sort of alluded to it. More features, um, completion of some of the foundation work that we've done. Um, more stability. I think a, a lot of the focus is going to be on that Pharos infrastructure, making sure that when I'm going from one lab, whether I'm trying to run on UCS or, or whether I'm going, trying to get in a Dell solution, that, that I'm not getting caught up on issues with the switch anymore. I, I don't want to be caught up trying to reconfigure the switch just because I want to run on one lab or another. We, we're going to look a lot more at alignment and normalization of those interfaces just to make sure that we can get things uh, running smoothly, we can, we can start to test more freely across different infrastructures. Um, ARM, 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 there is a lot of focus on ARM. We have three labs coming in already as, a, mm. as far as I'm aware. Um, we already have some scenarios which are running. They didn't quite make the Brahma Pooch release, but they'll be out in Colorado. Um, so get your, get your um, little um, Raspberry Pis out and build yourself a data center. Yeah, and, and we're building new stacks, so we're bringing the recent enhancements that were done at the data plane. So FIDO becomes a part of the overall picture with OpenStack, OpenDaylight, FIDO, or maybe directly OpenStack and FIDO directly integrated. Um, and we are hopefully also not only normalizing um, on kind of some of the delivery mechanisms, we're also normalizing on how we configure things. So uh, many people said, well, can't we describe scenarios, network setups in a more uniform way? Um, so that we can harmonize things and more easily deploy to certain hardware environments. Um, so you, that you're just articulating your network needs, your component needs in a uniform way, and then an installer is going to go pick up that configuration file, some YAML, and going to go and do the setup in accordance so that um, I think from a scenario composition perspective, it becomes less hard than it is today. Um, so hopefully we're getting there. Um, because it would help the overall CI CD pipeline quite a bit. Um, because right now, in many cases, we're doing from a testing perspective. The testing guys look at how the thing is configured, and based on that, they're running certain test suites. They can't go to a uniform description of what the deployment should look like. So you're looking into this and say, well, um, this particular SDN controller doesn't support that feature, so it doesn't make sense to test this. This is going to go fail for sure. Kind of which that's is, that's which odd, is right? Okay. And we're trying to go and get rid of that so that the testing guys are providing test infrastructure. Here's a test description of what you want to go run for a particular scenario. Go run it. And then it's very easy to qualify the outcome. And then you can really say, well, I want 100% of this. But right now, we're going to go pick and choose and say, well, we want 90% of this compliant. And we're just doing this pick and choose because, well, there is no norm normalized way to go and describe what should really happen. This all takes time. I mean, you have to, you have to hit the brick wall. You have, to, you have to try, you have to fail. And then you have to iterate, and you have to come back. Yeah. And you have to re rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. All the issues that we found in Brahmaputra when we started to do these complex integrations, we, we have to start to automate how to get around those. So for us, the automation of the solutions is, is, is critical. If we want to continue to grow and continue to bring in new features and continue to be able to verify that they work release over release, year over year, iteration and automation. These yeah, are, these and, are. And, and I think the other thing is be closer to upstream. Right now, I think if we're just composing things that are released quote-unquote versions, you're almost six months late, whatever you do. 
Six yeah. months is a long time for a developer. For somebody that wants something stable and deployable, hey, absolutely, we arrived at that. But we also have to go and cater far more for the developer. So fast feedback, you don't care about releases if you want fast feedback, but you care about the results. So let's find a vehicle for us to go and publish these results, integrate latest as opposed to stable, um, and then publish these results really quickly so that upstream developers and OpenStack, Open Daylight, OVS, what have you, will get that feedback really quickly. Because yeah. then want, I think more people will, ca will care about what we do. We want our releases to be boring. We yes. would like all the excitement to have when we're designing stuff, not when we're trying to plug it all in at the end. We need to get things more real time, uh, more attached to main. We need to, we need to have integration as a part of writing a line of so software. That's what um, by the way, I we're think we're, we're, we're obviously over time, but we started late. Nobody's worrying. Nobody's shouting. But I think we yeah. do have questions for, given that we're over time, we have, question, we have time for at least one question. If we have a question. If we have a, of course there's questions. Do we of get course. A, that, was, that was a request for a plug. Let's go repeat. Um, so the, quest, the question was, will we get an update on the progress at the OPNFV Summit in Berlin in June of this year? Go to opnfv.org to sign up, la la la. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> marketing, uh, marketing is here, yes, absolutely. There is a summit in Berlin. Uh, Berlin is really nice in summer. Uh, go come and join us. Um, by the way, when is, when is Colorado? When do the waters of Colorado start to flow in? After summer. After summer. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> We're aiming for six months cadence. So, so it actually is a really good point. We want to hit a six month cadence. We, we want to be coming out every six months on time, every time. Uh, we're approaching it. I think maybe at this point in time, we haven't really figured out where in the calendar year those, those cadences will be. Colorado, I think we, when we set out to do it, we set out to do it in August. It may be that it may, be, it may make sense to but do it in September. But when you say that yeah. I'm being European, I, I can go and embark on a nice vacation in, in summer and then after that, I'm not going to the, criticize the six of weeks Colorado of vacation. Is go no, hit me. no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get sick. Probably weeks. late September. <laughs> Probably late September. Okay. Yeah. Good. So, do we have any more questions well, here? Quick one. Uh, do you anticipate some benchmarks being submitted upstream, like for firewall or load balancer type of workloads? I so anticipate part of your SFC chains. So, so I anticipate. I, I, I don't. I don't know about the term benchmark. What I anticipate is I anticipate repetitive. Verification of performance, latency, and, and, and system state and system capability repeated over and over again on different labs with different infrastructure solutions. Um, as far as a benchmark is concerned, well, how's it run now compared to what ran before? I think that's perfectly okay as a benchmark, but I don't think we're going to come out and say, this is okay and that's not okay. Uh, because different deployments require different yeah. contexts, require different characteristics. It's, it's very hard to say, okay, we need, you know. And uh, did, well, okay or not okay are a case by case, exactly. customer by customer decision. So, what we're going to go and enable no, no, you to no, do, no. and that you can do that today. You no. bring your stuff, Cla and we run question, your maybe. firewall as part of Yardstick test cases. Why not? Okay. But why I asked that question is you said you'll boil down your 24 scenarios to maybe about six. And you mentioned the e EPC case and all. So to say, hey, this will work for EPC with this sort of reference configuration, we need some way to quantify what's an acceptable latency or performance. Right? Exactly. And, and, and at this point in time, we have absolutely no idea what that looks like. Um, but what we will be able to do is we, we will be able to publish this works around about here. With, with so much compute and so much networking and so on and so forth. I mean, we get these characteristics and behaviors out of our platform. That's what we'll be able to say. And then as we do work upstream and as we, as we, as we isolate issues and, and pr improve things, we'll, we will be able to demonstrate that it improves uh, over time, I would hope. And the documented behavior you get today. So one of the test cases that we run is uh, Clearwater's virtual IMS case. That's something that Orange stood up because they said, well, our management really likes that test case because we're standing up 10 VMs and we're running all the test suites that are part of the IMS. And uh, we're documenting the results, right? They're published. They're all public exactly. because, well, the Jenkins results are all public um, and we, well, publish all these things. And so you can go and compare. Yeah, and, and I, you, I think you do the comparison, not us. I, I think the point okay. that we're trying to make is we, we, we don't want to state what the benchmark should be. That's, that's really not something that we as an open source community want to be doing. We, what we want to be able to state is this is what you can get and this is how well it's going to perform. And, and it supports these use cases in this way. 
if it's not good enough, come and help us fix it. Okay, that's fine. Well, I think we need to call it a day. I think we should get off. Someone's probably standing out there waiting for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, everyone.